interested in visiting with you, us today, a very special welcome to you. Uh, we've been in our study of the book of Acts, and today we're going to be covering uh, chapters 21 through 28, so we'll be finishing up today. And today is also, our lesson is going to be our preparation for the communion. Kyle will come at the end, but then he'll just say a prayer and get our hearts ready. I think the lesson today will be particularly powerful to draw us near to the cross and near to Jesus. You know, the book of Acts wasn't always called the book of Acts. It was named the Acts of the Apostles at the end of the second century by a guy named Irenaeus. And in a way, I suppose that's a good enough name for it, but as I read the scriptures, I think we should call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it's God working through men and working through events so that his will can be done. The title of our lesson today is Evangelizing the World in a Generation. In Acts 1 and verse 8, we, of course, have Jesus giving the last charge to the apostles. He says, I, I want you to be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. He wanted the world evangelized in a generation. At the end of the book of Acts, we find that Paul is going to be in prison. And of course, he writes the prison epistles here, and one of them is the book of Colossians. And in Colossians 1 verse 23, it says that God's word has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Now the date probably was traditionally given of 33 AD, but actually probably the beginning of Acts is 29 AD because Jesus most likely was born in 4 BC. So from about 29 AD to about 6061 is a generation, and that's how long it took to evangelize the world in Paul's day. And we can do it today. Are you with me here, church? Let's go to Acts chapter 9 and see Paul's calling. Come on, Kev. Come on. Paul had a calling even before he became a Christian, even before he was baptized. And God tells his calling to Ananias, who will convey it to Paul. It says in verse 15, Go! This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That was his charge. He was to take the message, number one, to the Gentiles. Number two, to their kings. And number three, to Israel. And the way that he was to do it was through suffering. That was how the world was evangelized in a generation. You know, the first missionary journey is recorded, as you recall, in chapters 13 and 14. The second one in chapters 16 through 18. And the third missionary journey, which we studied the last time we got together, was chapters 18 through 21. And so we're going to go back to chapter 21 and pick it up just as Paul is coming back from his third missionary journey into Jerusalem. We read this in verse 17. When we arrived at Jerusalem, so we know that Luke is with him, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James. This is the half-brother of Jesus. And all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. And they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses. Well, right here, we find an incredible exchange. Paul comes back from his third missionary journey, and he gathers the leaders of the church, and he reports to them in detail what God had done. Of course, here in the City of Angels Church, we've kind of torn a page from the book of Acts because at every Bible talk leaders meeting, at every staff meeting, at every house church leaders meeting, we have what we call a time of good news sharing. Amen? Because we want to brag about what God has done through our ministry. You know, very interestingly, the word evangelizing literally means in the Greek, spreading the good news. That's what evangelizing is all about. Spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And right here, Paul reported in detail the good news of how the gospel is spread. Well, as many of you know, Elaine and I just returned back from Santiago, Chile. 
as well as coming back from Chicago, and then I was also gone to Phoenix, Arizona. And, I mean, the Lord is doing great things. Now, I'm not going to go into a great detail right here, but I've got to brag on what God is doing. You know, uh, we were so excited to go back to Santiago because when we started the new discipling movement a little over a year ago, that church rejected it. And Ra Raul Mourinho, who had been discipling for a couple of years, took a step back. And yet, he took the next eight months to study through the scriptures about what it really meant to make Jesus the Lord of your life. What it really meant to call every single member of the church to be a sold-out disciple of Jesus Christ. And does the scriptures really teach we're supposed to evangelize the world in a generation? After eight months, he says, yes, it is. And so I get this phone call. He says, Kip, this is Raul. I go, Raul who? He says, Raul Mourinho. He says, I don't know where to start, but bro... I want to apologize. I was wrong about everything. Do you think it's too late to join? I said, brother, it's never too late. And so he and his wife took a courageous stand. And it's incredible. 22 of the Bible Talk leaders came with them. They have a church of 29 just a couple of months ago. They've already had five baptisms. And the Sunday that we were there, they had 103 people at church. Is that incredible what God is doing? And that's going to be our pillar church for all of South America. Now, the reason I was down there, Elaine and I were there with the Sullivans, because the Sullivans who lead the Phoenix Church right now are going to be going to take over the work in Santiago, Chile. And Raul and Linda are going to be coming back here in June. Amen, guys? Now, it also was exciting to be in Chicago, because Chicago Church is doing great. They just had a mission team of 20 sold-out disciples go there to Chicago a year and a half ago, joining a tiny remnant group, and a year and a half later, they have 71 sold-out disciples with about 150 every Sunday morning. Amen? And then in Phoenix, where the Sullivans have been working, they had a little team of just 14 disciples from Portland, and a little remnant group that was there, and excitingly, now in a year and a half, they have 50 disciples and over 100 on Sunday morning. I mean, God is really moving. You know, the exciting thing also is not only are great things happening in those places, but also in London. We shared with you just a, a couple of months ago about the starting of the new London church, amen? with 19 sold-out disciples. And it was so exciting that people on the continent in Paris heard about it, and they said, can we form a Bible talk of sold-out disciples and start something here in Paris? And we said, absolutely, because Tim and Leanne, being from Canada, are totally fluent in French. Well, they got things going in London. They went down to preach in Paris. It was great. And then they tried to get back into England, and they couldn't get in. They were blocked by Satan, we thought. And, of course, Tim called me. Bro, I'm blocked. <laughs> what do I do? I said, bro, we're going to have to pay for tickets to go to Toronto. And, you know, we have a lot. We have the Holy Spirit. We have all the great things the Lord has blessed us with. But one thing we don't have a lot in the movement is money. Amen, guys? <laughs> so I said, well, we'll buy you tickets. So they go back to Toronto. And it turns out that Leanne's visa was one of the problems. And they'd gone to trying to save money to a kind of a cheaper uh -oh. visa-getting place. And this place cut the corner on them, you know. And said that she was single, so she'd be more easily gotten into England. Well, amen. They saw that Tim and Leanne were righteous in the whole thing. And so the government penalized this visa company $5,000. Not only making up for the tickets, but giving them a little bit of extra money to get back there into London. Amen. Is that awesome? I mean, God is always working. Sometimes we think something's bad, but it's good. God's out to bless us. We need a little extra money. And so the visa company gave it to us. Amen. <laughs> Right now, Tim, Tim recently just left London. He is down in Kinshasa at our church down there in the Republic of Congo. We have 50 disciples now down there. They have over 100 every Sunday morning there in the middle of Africa. God's word is spreading everywhere. I can't wait till next summer when the Holy Spirit sends out the Commonsbirds and the New York team to New York City. Amen? And then, of course, we read about just last week in the bulletin how the Smellies and the Miss team are going to Washington, D.C. next summer. Both will be sent out at the Jubilee. And though I can't go into detail right now, there's going to be a second church coming out in India. We're already in Mumbai, and there's going to be another city that's joining us in, a, in our fight to evangelize the world. And, you know, I mean, it's so exciting what's happening every place. But I'm particularly excited about what's happening in Central America, of course. About a year ago, the church in San Pedro Sula said, listen, we want to take a stand for God and a stand for discipling. No matter what the cost is relationship-wise, we're going to take a stand for God. They came on out, just 50 of them, with a non-full-time leadership. In one year time, the Holy Spirit multiplied them to 75 disciples. At their anniversary service, they had almost 500 people. Is that incredible? 
Now, what's really exciting, today we have the Moraleses with us, Jose and Laura, and they're here visiting to talk to us about a new church in Guatemala and a new church in El Salvador. See, God is moving all over the world, and we need to see this is not a movement of men, it is a movement of God. Are you with me right here? Now, the exciting thing is we get back to our text. Is that after Paul shared all of this, the, the apostles came on back and said, Well, Paul, you, you got to see all the thousands of Jews that have become Christians in Jerusalem. Now, some people think that the, the Bible exaggerates numbers. Absolutely not. There were thousands of Jews that became disciples in Jerusalem. And they said, Paul, they've heard all sorts of garbage about you. They've, they, they've heard all sorts of negative things. And Paul, well, we want you to do something to show that you still honor the law. He says, we want you to take the Nazarite vow. So he takes the Nazarite vow, and then we pick it up in verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. These are non-Christians. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he's brought the Greeks in the temple area and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed... That Paul brought him in the temple area. How often, when we assume things, we assume the wrong right here. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander, or better translated, the tribune of the Roman troops, that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Wow, you're going, oh my goodness, look at the controversy around Paul. Everywhere he goes, there are riots. As a matter of fact, the Roman soldiers, the tribune, had to come and rescue Paul from the Jewish people. You know, we got to understand, if we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be like Paul, we're going to be controversial. We're going to be persecuted. There are a lot of churches that were the name of Christ, they're not being persecuted. And my Bible teaches me that Jesus and everybody that followed him were persecuted because they were out evangelizing. They were spreading the good news. How about it? When was the last time you were persecuted? When was the last time you suffered for the gospel? Now, right now, it looks pretty bad for Paul, doesn't it? Well, Paul says, hey, I want to talk to this crowd. So the Roman soldier lets Paul talk to all the people that want to kill him. Now that's a heart for God, isn't it? And he shares his conversion. And we read on down and we pick it up in the middle of his account in chapter 22, verse 22. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. You know, isn't it going to be exciting today to see five people baptized into Christ? And each of these people have co- had to come to an individual decision to say, Jesus is Lord. And then they're immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins to wash away their sins. You know, I'm, I'm really moved in a special way by Tony and Carol Castillo. You know, sometimes couples, they, they come to the Lord at separate moments, but this couple has come to God at the same time. And so now their marriage is going to be enriched as they both give themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now they'll be closer to one another than ever before. I mean, it's also exciting to be able to see kingdom kids coming back in the fold. Amen? Uh, You know, of course, we love Dave Swan to death. And uh, Kyle, his son, just got baptized a few weeks ago. And today, Cassie's getting baptized. Is that awesome? His daughter. And then, can you believe it? Salute Gonzalez is getting baptized. (laughs) Now, Salute is a little bit notorious in Portland. I'm not going to detail all of her sins, but let's just put it this way. I'm so glad you're repenting. Amen? You know, for a lot of parents, their biggest worry is their kids. Listen, you've got to give your kids over to the Lord. But one of the toughest things to do is to watch your kid become a sinner. And newsflash, they all do. And they got your genetics. 
They got your predisposition to sin. Let me tell you something. You cannot get your kids to heaven. It takes God. It takes the church. It takes the Holy Spirit. And it takes you living a life. That's a great example for them. But sometimes we see kids go their separate ways, just like the prodigal son. We've still got to be faithful to God. Just like Dave Swan. Just like the Gonzaleses. And then... The kids will see that God is in your life, and when the time is right, when they start eating the pig pots, then they'll come back to God. Amen, guys? So it's exciting. Now, right here in the text, it also omits that three-year period that Paul went to Arabia to be with Jesus, but we read in verse 17 of chapter 22. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, These men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. You know, right here, Paul never forgot the time that he saw the first Christian martyr. And you know, Paul got to preach there at the church in Jerusalem. Can you imagine preaching? To a crowd where you're talking to the widow of a guy that you killed. Or talking to the children of parents that you put in prison. See, in the New Testament church, there was such a heart of forgiveness. That they could even forgive someone that killed a member of their family. Come on, You know, over the past few years, we've seen some shocking things happen in our former fellowship. But one thing that I've seen is bitterness creep in, not just to the hurts that we've received, but particularly other family members. But that bitterness is going to block you from praying to God to help these people come back to the Lord. What a testimony that the Jerusalem church is to receive Paul, not just as a member, he was the preacher. Is that incredible? You see, we need to have this basic conviction. Evangelizing brings suffering. Spreading the good news brings suffering. But get this. Suffering brings evangelism. Because Stephen suffered, Paul never forgot his worst of sins. And he used that as a motivation to preach the word like few others throughout all of history. Amen? Let's keep going. In verse 21, at the end of that, it says, The Lord said to me, Go, I'll send you far away to the Gentiles. You see, God makes it clear your destiny. God has a destiny for everybody. He's got a will. Now, not everybody fulfills their destiny because you've got to be faithful in Christ. If you're not faithful to God, then you're not experiencing your destiny. Right here, Paul was suffering, but he was faithful. And so he saw very clearly the Jews in Jerusalem were rejecting him. And so God says, listen, I'm sending you far away to the Gentiles. Now, probably Paul was going, amen. We've got to embrace our destiny right here. Because that was what God told him even before he was baptized. You will preach the Gentiles and their kings and the Jews. And you'll do this through suffering. Amen. So our three basic points are this. Evangelizing brings suffering. Evangelizing brings kings. And evangelizing brings adventure. (laughs) Well, let's look right here. In verse 22, chapter 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him! He's not fit to live! As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken to the barracks. He directed he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported, What are you going to do, he asked. This man's a Roman citizen. Now, you've got to understand... A Roman citizen cannot be flogged until he's proven guilty. And so right here we get an insight to how powerful and how unbelievable genius God is. You know, we always teach the non-Christians that we study with that God appoints the exact places and time that we meet them so that they will seek him, reach out for him, and find him. 
But sometimes as Christians, we forget that God appointed the very place that we were born and wove us genetically perfect inside our mom's womb for a purpose. Paul was born a Roman citizen. That plays out huge in the rest of the book of Acts. It was not by accident. It was the plan of God. And by Paul being faithful to God, now his destiny was being revealed. And God's plan of making him into a Roman citizen. Amen? So what happens right here is they stop the flogging. Amen? (laughs) And so the... Tribune says, or the commander is the international version, says, hey, I've got to find out why everybody is making such a fuss over this man. One guy. So he takes him to the leaders of what he considers Paul's people, the Sanhedrin. Let's look at chapter 23. Remember, evangelizing brings suffering. Spreading the good news brings suffering. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to you, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, you dare insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I, I didn't realize he was the high priest. For it's written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Exodus chapter 22, verse 28. See, right here, it was wrong for Ananias to have Paul struck. And you could just feel Paul's depth of feeling here. You whitewashed tomb! How dare you do that? Now, he was not incorrect. History records that this Ananias guy was an evil and corrupt fellow. So Paul was not wrong in his measurement of this guy. And yet the people around said, Hey, Paul, have you forgotten the scriptures? You can't insult the ruler of God's people. Paul goes, Oh, guys, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. You know, right here we see something very powerful. A lot of times when we're 90% right, think that 90% right allows 10% wrong. And that's why we continue to battle with our wife. That's why we continue to battle with our husband. Say, how do you know that, brother? Because this Tuesday, Elaine and I celebrate our 31st wedding anniversary. Now, that's older than a lot of you guys out there. How do do you hang in there that long? You learn to apologize. You learn to own it. And what's amazing is the longer that you're married the more of a sinner that you see yourself to be. And if you're a disciple, the more precious you consider your mate. But you know, I think this concept of apology is huge. It's huge. I think it's something that really prevented our former fellowship from really coming together. I believe the only thing that can bring people together is forgiveness. It's the love of Christ. And I've just got to ask you right now, is there anybody that you're separated from out there? Is there anybody you're not right with? And you say, well, they did this, they did this. You know, they may have done that. But just, I mean, what did you do wrong? That you need to apologize for. Now, our brother Paul apologized for what he did wrong, but he did not lose his basic convictions about what was the right thing to do. And so let's read on. Then Paul, knowing that some were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, called out in the state here, my brother, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he did this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, we find nothing wrong with this guy. Isn't that awesome? Amen. <laughs> what if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. You know why he said take courage? Because Paul needed to take courage. Even Paul got afraid. He says, Take courage. This is God speaking. As you've testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome. Wow. You see, back in Acts chapter 19, verse 21, 
Paul told the brothers, he says, I think it would be good for me to go to Rome because Paul understood that he needed to get to the major metropolitan cities of the Roman world in order to evangelize the world. That was his dream. But now, his dream has become his destiny. You know, it's really cool. When we need some help down in Santiago, I called up Matt and Helen and I said, Hey, what do you think about you guys going down and leading the church in Santiago? That's going to be our pillar church for South America. And Matt goes, You know, I just have to think about it. Helen goes, That's always been my dream! Even as a little girl, I dreamed about being a missionary in South America. Matt goes, I, I just need some time to think about this. I just need some time. You know, sometimes we need a little bit of time, don't we? Yeah. But sometimes we find that our dreams become our destiny. And right here, Paul's destiny is clear. God wants him to go to Rome. We find out this in verse 12. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they'd killed Paul. Now, that's a pretty serious oath. <laughs> well, word gets out, and believe it or not, Paul's nephew hears about it. Who's a disciple? He tells the commander, and the commander does this. Verse 22. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, Don't tell anyone that you've reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered him, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. Wow. Here are these guys that have made this plot to kill Paul. How serious? They're not going to eat and they're not going to drink. The word gets back to the tribune. He says, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen, and they're all guarding Paul. Yeah. See, God, this is, this is not the acts of the apostles. This is the acts of the Holy Spirit right here. God is taking care. Yes, he's incarcerated. Yes, he's suffering. But God has a plan in the midst of this suffering that's something greater than what even Paul could see at that time. Are you going through tough times right now? Is there any suffering in your life? You need to understand that this is all from God for a purpose. God's going to take care of you as long as you seek first the kingdom. Then he'll give you everything you need. Now, if you're not seeking first the kingdom, there's some problems. And God will let you suffer until you see your need to turn to him. Amen? Well, right here it's exciting because he's going to be taken now to Governor Felix. You know, I remember just a few weeks ago in London when I got that death threat. It at first shook me, because it was a very serious death threat. But then, when I had all the English bobbies, the policemen surrounding us the whole time we went everywhere, I go, this is awesome. God is protecting us. Amen. See, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And whatever the promises in Scripture are, they are true. Amen. Just believe them and put them into practice. See, evangelizing brings suffering. But suffering brings evangelism. Our second point is evangelizing brings kings. Well, in chapter 24, we find that Paul is going to be brought before Governor Felix. One of the historians of that day, Tacitus, said that Felix was the slave of Antonia, the mother of the Emperor Claudius. And so in history, he's recorded as Antonius Felix or Claudius Felix. But he evidently was a very wicked murderous and very arbitrary guy. And so this is the guy God wants him to share with. Chapter 24, verse 1. <clears throat> Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullius. So this Ananias guy really wants Paul, right? And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullius presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you and your foresight has brought about reform in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this for profound gratitude. He's trying to butter up Felix right here. But in order not to worry you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. You know, right here, if you would be listening to the criticism against Paul, you would call him... A troublemaker, stirring up riots, 
and he's doing this all over the world. He's even the ringleader of a Nazarene cult. That's what people in the world would have you believe about Paul. You know, we need to understand that when people amongst us are criticized, they're going to twist the truth. And we as disciples need to say, hold it, what kind of life is this person living? What is the fruit of his ministry? What, what, what can we see that is of Jesus and not of Jesus? And stop listening to all the garbage that's said out there. Are you with me right here, guys? Well, Paul makes his defense. And after he makes his defense, we read in verse 22 these words. Then Felix, who is well acquainted with the way, that's Christianity, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I'll decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of him. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Well, right here, it's very interesting. We now meet the wife of Felix, who historically is a much more famous person than Felix himself. Now, Drusilla, yes, her name, she committed adultery by being with Felix. Yet she was a Jew, and he was a non-Jew. She was one of the three famous daughters of Herod Agrippa I. Now, who's Herod Agrippa I? He's the guy that killed the Apostle James. He's the guy that was eaten by worms. And the Bible says that not only was her father the guy that killed James, but her great uncle was Herod Antipas. He's the one that beheaded John the Baptist. And her great-grandpa was Herod the Great, He's the one that had the babies killed in Jerusalem when Jesus was born. That's quite a heritage, huh? And yet, God saw fit to give her a chance. But God also took her life when Mount Vesuvius blew in Pompeii in 79. What an ignoble death. She actually is one of three daughters. One was Drusilla, the second was Marianne, and the third was Bernice, who we'll meet in a moment. You know, very interestingly, even though this was the governor, Paul laid it out. He talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. You know, I've got to ask you a question. Have you laid it out with all your friends about righteousness, self-control, and judgment? Have you laid it out with your family? I mean, Christmas is coming. A lot of us are going back to be at the family. How about it? What is our heart? You know, so many of us are so ungod focused and we're so relationship crazy that we're, we're afraid to lose relationship for the sake of the truth. Paul said, listen, Felix, you've got to deal with righteousness, self-control, and judgment. And he, and he began, began to be afraid. And he says, Paul, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, you, you may leave, and when I find it convenient, I'll send for you. You know, there never was a, a convenient time. You know, we have a lot of people right now that are studying the Bible here in the auditorium. And you're thinking, well, self-control, judgment, righteousness. I just, but I've got these financial problems. I've got these things I have to deal with my family. I've got this and that. Maybe next year, when it's more convenient, I'll make a decision. We've got a lot of remnant people here that are, that are fall away and some are attending other churches. And, and their lives are just full of other things besides God. And they know they should be dealing with God, but they're going, well, I've got to find a more convenient time to deal with the issues of my life. There never is a convenient time. You need to make a decision to do it now. Are you with me there, church? You know, I really believe that Today is going to be awesome for several of us just watching each of the baptisms and just seeing the joy they have of giving everything up for God. You know, in the final part of chapter 24, we find that 
Felix is succeeded by Portius Festus. In actuality, he was replaced by Nero because of his incompetence. And so, Portius Festus was appointed the new governor by Nero in about 60 AD. Well, he comes on in, and he wants to hear all about Paul and and what was going on. And the Bible says like this in verse 8. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I'm now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourselves know very well. If, however, I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. Now, that's, that's a bold statement, but you've got to understand that if he's guilty, he's going to die anyway. Amen. So, amen. That's good. <laughs> but if the charges brought you against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You've appealed to Caesar? To Caesar, you will go! Oh my goodness. It's now becoming clear why he was born a Roman citizen. See, not anybody in the Roman Empire could have their case brought to Caesar, who lives in Rome. Only a Roman citizen could. And even though the authorities right here did not want to take it to Rome, because they couldn't find anything wrong with them, Paul said, listen, I refuse to go someplace in Israel to deal with this issue. As a Roman citizen, I appeal to Caesar. And Festus was left with no choice. He says, you appeal to Caesar? Then to Caesar, you will go. Is that awesome, church? We need to understand that when we seek God in his kingdom first, God will give us everything we need. And our destiny will unfold before our very eyes. In verse 13, we read on. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. So, they've come to tell Festus, hey, great going, getting the job there as governor. That's awesome. And the question comes, well, who is this King Agrippa? Well, this King Agrippa is the son of the guy that killed James and was eaten by worms. He's the brother of Drusilla. And get this, he's the brother of Bernice who he's living with. That's how gross of a relationship. And they're both Jews. They're both Jews. And yet, we find that Paul was called to evangelize the kings. Why? Because these people hold great sway over thousands of others. Well, King Agrippa talks with Festus. Festus says, hey, I'm having trouble writing up this letter to tell the people in Rome why I'm sending Paul. Can you help me? And King Agrippa says, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to hear this guy, Paul. I've heard a lot about him. Verse 23. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officials and the leading men of the city. Can you imagine Paul drooling at this audience? He's got the kings. He's got the leading men of the city. Why? Because evangelizing brings suffering. And evangelizing, spreading the good news, brings kings. Even kings realize their innate need for God. There is no one, nowhere, that doesn't need God. Now, at the moment, they may not feel it. But there will be a day that they feel it. Paul gives his defense. And we read the last of his defense in chapter 19, verse 26. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, and then those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I've had God's help this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets of Moses said would happen. That Christ would suffer, and for the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king's familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, 
because it was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know that you do. Is that cranking or not? Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long? I pray that God, not only you, but all those who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. Is that your heart about everybody that's around you? That you want them to be a Christian and they know that you want them to be a Christian. You know, it was getting kind of heavy as Paul was sharing. And then when Paul goes after King Agrippa, he says, do you believe in the prophets? He's a Jew. And then he goes, I know you do. So he tries to make light. <laughs> Do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? You know how some people, when it's getting really heavy, they want to make light? And Paul, he goes, I could just see him with a big smile. Short time or long, I'm coming after you. <laughs> see, everybody knew what Paul was about. Paul was all about other people having a relationship with God. It was, it was so awesome having this sense of purpose in his life. Spreading the good news. That's evangelism. You know, sad. There are people today that think evangelism is a burden. Such a twisted view that Satan has put into their heart. Perhaps there was bitterness caused by some other event that happened in their life. But we need to understand that evangelism is of God. And evangelism is good news. And evangelism even brings kings. You know, I thought about this and in my life, the Lord has blessed me, I think, to be able to share with three kings. Christmas time, three kings. I thought that was clever. The first was the king of the courts in 1990, Magic Johnson. I'd come to visit the church and uh, Somehow there was a conversation that the, the Lakers were practicing down at UCLA. And I said, oh man, I'd, I'd just like to go see them. And so I go to UCLA's place, and sure enough, they were there in kind of pickup game. And there was Magic Johnson. I go, oh wow, this is, this is awesome. And then one of the brothers says, you know, bro, I know you're from Boston, and you got to understand, here in L.A., it's very uncool to reach out to celebrities and sports figures like this. So, bro, you just need to stand back and just, just, just watch. I said, but we got to invite him to church. No, no, bro, that would be uncool. Well, that ticked me off. So I kind of moved away from that individual. And I waited and I waited. And then finally there was a break in the game. And I saw that Magic Johnson, like all human beings, had to go for water. So... There's a little line in the water fountain. I'm standing by the water fountain like this. <laughs> Each of the guys come through, and Magic's just trying to ignore me. And so finally, he, his eyes catch mine. And I look at him, and I said, he says, you know all about me. He says, who are you? I said, my name's Kip. And one time, the Lakers were visiting the Celtics in Boston Garden, and I'm the preacher there at the Boston Garden, the church that meets there. And we were the ones that made the game late that day. He says, I remember that. <laughs> and we started talking and going back and forth. And it was awesome spending those 20 minutes and then inviting him on out to church. Later on, even my kids got to go on over to his house. He was the king of the court. Then there was another king, though not reigning at the time, President Carter. And say what you will in your political persuasion, everybody needs to be saved. Right. Republicans need to be saved and Democrats need to be saved. And even you independents, amen? Yes. But I never, I never, he's a very gracious man and Roz was there and, and, and once more, I invited him to church. But perhaps my, my greatest, so to speak, Forrest Gump moment. <laughs> And Forrest Gump was the guy in the movie that just got to meet all these huge personalities and he shouldn't have been there. <laughs> was a chance I got to go and meet, at that time, the president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. And I remember going in, you had to go through this big check and everything, and they go through this, and I was the first one through, and, and I was going on into what they called the White House. And so I opened the door, 
and you know, it's, it, it's the White House. You're expecting guards and all these other people that are in there. And I see this figure looming in the shadows. And so I didn't know what else to do but go, hi. And then he steps out of the shadow. It's Nelson Mandela. He goes, hi. That's how we headed off right there. We spent the next half an hour just talking about what our church was doing in South Africa, particularly with all the AIDS victims. Sadly, that work has now been totally obliterated. But because of what we did for the poor and those that were hurting, I was able to say, listen, I want you to come to church. He says, I really want to come. But even for Nelson Mandela, the time never became convenient. We need to be evangelizing the kings. Amen? Let's close out our study looking at chapters 27 and 28. In verse 1 it says in 27, When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. Now right here, Julius then secures a boat. The boat eventually goes over to Crete and there's a discussion about whether or not they should keep on going on their trip. And we read this in verse 9. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast or Yom Kippur. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was the harbor and creep facing both southwest and northwest. So right here, the centurion listens to Paul. Paul says, we shouldn't go. And then he listens to the majority. Uh-oh. And they say, we should go. So just keep that in mind. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called a northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm, could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of the small anchor at Cauta, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. For any we'd run aground on the sandbars of Citrus, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. I appreciate Paul. You know, he's always a guy that doubles back on things and not sail for Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all those who sail with you. So keep up your courage, man. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. We're going to have a shipwreck. (laughs) Paul was a master of the understatement. (laughs) Right here, we find, I think, the secret of Paul's faith. You know, a lot of people say, well, I... I, I want to have more faith. How do, you, how do you become a great woman of faith? How do you become a great man of faith? It's right here. Right here in verse 25. Paul says, For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Whatever the scriptures promise, you believe it. And it will happen just as he told you. We lack faith because we lack obedience. And when you believe in the word of God, that it will happen just as he told you. It will happen. You know, we have brothers and sisters here married to non-Christian spouses. The Bible says you just be a cranking disciple. You be an awesome wife. You be an awesome husband. And someday, they're going to turn themselves in. You know, the Bible promises you train up a child in the ways you go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from his way. Now, he may depart for a while. But if you're faithful, he will, she will come back. Amen? Amen. Amen. Salute on that one. Amen. Okay. We find that they do have a shipwreck. All the people are safe. And they shipwreck on the island Malta. Well, after being there for a while, they catch another ship and they go on towards the port nearest Rome. And read in verse 11 of chapter 28. 
After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered an island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods of Castor and Pollux. We put into Syracuse to stay there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came on the following day, and we reached Petulii. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers there heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the form of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. We got to Rome. Paul's allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. I mean, right here, we see why. When anybody flies into town, we have a group of disciples that go greet them. Amen? When, when Paul was coming into Rome, the disciples in Rome didn't wait for him. They went all the way out to three taverns right there, and they greeted Paul. And even the great apostle Paul was so fired up to see disciples finally. We find also that Paul stayed with the disciples. We need to all be hospitable in opening up our homes. Are you with me right here? I mean, this is what disciples are all about. What's mine is yours, and yours is mine. Paul gets to Rome. We read this. Verse 17. Three days later, he called together leaders of Jews. When they assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I've done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I've asked to see you and to talk with you because it is the hope of Israel that I'm bound with these chains. They replied, We've not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there have reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. Everybody was talking about Christianity. But it wasn't necessarily from a positive perspective. It was negative. Very interesting, Paul said, Hey, you probably got some letters from the people in Judea that are pretty negative about me. He says, no, we've not even read any letters. You know, they had negative letters back then too. Amen? Verse 23. <laughs> they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus, the law of Moses, and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Closing out verse 28. Paul says, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They'll listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him boldly and without hindrance. He preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we live in a day where there's a tendency towards what I call super spiritualism. Some people say, well, we just need to preach the cross. Well, Paul does say, I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I say, well, I just need to preach Jesus. But you know, when you examine the text here very carefully as you go through the whole book of Acts, do you know what the theme of Paul's preaching was? Yes, it was about Jesus, but he preached the kingdom of God. We see that very clearly in verse 23, and we see that very clearly at the end in verse 31. Why is that so amazing? Because the true kingdom of God is not just any church on the corner. The kingdom of God is where the lion lays down with the lamb. The kingdom of God is where people are willing to lay down their lives, not just for Jesus, but for one another. The kingdom of God is the only place where you'll find people of all different backgrounds, creeds, colors, coming together for one unified purpose. To praise God and evangelize the world in His name. We need to get a conviction, guys, that it's good to talk about the kingdom. Now, we worship Jesus. But the most tangible thing that Jesus said, people would know that we are His, is our love for one another. And so I see nothing wrong when I share my faith. Say, hey, you got to come to my church. It is a cranking church. It's awesome. We've got some awesome young people. We've got some cranking old people. It is awesome. And everybody's committed. It is incredible. And so often people say, well, tell me more. Tell me more. Well, right here, some people say, well, what happened to Paul? Well, first of all, we need to understand 
The book of Acts is not about Paul. I don't think it is the Acts of the Apostle. It is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And by the end, Paul got to Rome. He spent two years in prison. And so, most likely had some audience with Caesar. And so by evangelizing the most powerful man in his day, so to speak, through his influence, the world would know. You know, it's interesting. Other books, such as the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, show us that this was not Paul's last imprisonment. He was likely freed in about 62 AD and then rearrested in 66 AD and then killed in 67. You know, I can't help but think about Paul's life and the words of Jesus rarely used. We quote all the time John 3, 1 through 7. Got to be born again of the water and the spirit. And that's a good thing to quote. Amen. At the football times, they're always quoting John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. And that's a good one to quote. But I believe that we need to understand that evangelizing brings adventure. In John 3, 8, Jesus said, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The wind that blew Paul beyond Crete and on the Malta and then blew him literally to Italy was a wind that he didn't know where it was going or where it was coming from. But he knew that God was his guide. He didn't understand at the beginning why he was born a Roman citizen. He didn't understand why he, a Jew, was called to the Gentiles. But at the end of the day, he got to preach before their kings. And Paul was able to write that everyone under heaven had heard. You know, I remember when we were first gathering up the mission team, this couple from Florida, Jeannie and Jack Fred Fredericks, had asked us to uh, come and see, see Portland. And uh, it was awesome because when they came, they were mesmerized by it. And I remember talking to Jack and saying, Jack, Bro, come and join us when we go down to Portland. And so he said, well, I don't know. I said, bro, you're 50-some years old. You got time for one last adventure. <laughs> Has your life last lost adventure? When Jeannie and Jack came, they placed membership at the church, but later on discovered they needed to be restored. And when they were restored, their son, Jared, was baptized into Christ. See, so many Christians have an emptiness and a grief inside their heart because they're not out evangelizing. And if you're not out evangelizing, you're missing out on the adventure. You know, I'm going to close with the words of a book by a guy named John Pollock. It's entitled, The Man Who Shook the World. It's about Paul. Let me close with these thoughts. Of Paul's final trial, nothing is known beyond a tradition. He was condemned by resolution of the Senate on the charge of treason against the divine emperor. How long Simon, Peter, and Paul were imprisoned together before being executed the same day, as an early and strong belief asserts, cannot be fixed, possibly as much as nine months. The date honored in the city of their martyrdom is 20, June 29, 67. Peter nailed to a cross as a public spectacle in Nero's circus, head downward, as on request, and Paul, as a Roman citizen, beheaded in a less public manner. They marched him out to the walls past the period of Cermus, which still stands on the Ostian way towards the sea. Crowds journeying to or from Ostia would recognize an execution squad by the lictors with their phallics of rods and axes, and the executioner standing and carrying a sword, which in Nero's reign had replaced the axe. It was not to his shame that he walked, he was not degraded. He was going to a feast, to a triumph, to the crowning day to which he'd pressed forward. He who had talked often to God's promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus could not fear. He believed as he had spoken. All God's promises find their yes in him. No executioner was going to lose him the conscious presence of Jesus. He was not changing his company, only the place where he enjoyed it. Better still, he would see Jesus. Those glimpses on the Damascus Road, in Jerusalem, at Corinth, on the sinking ship, now he was going to see him face to face to know even as he had been known. At first light, the soldiers took Paul to the pillar 
The executioner stood ready, stark naked. Soldiers stripped Paul the waist and tied him, kneeling upright to the low pillar which left his neck free. Some accounts say the lictors beat him with rods. A beating had been the usual prelude to beheading, but in recent years had not been inflicted. If they must administer this last senseless dose of pain to the body so soon to die, who shall separate us from love of Christ? Shall tribulation or the sword? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the flash of the sword, the glory. We'll see our brother Paul in heaven. Bring as many as people as possible with you. Thank you, and God bless.